Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, my talk, Design in Detail. Um, first, I'd like to thank GDC, and I'd especially like to thank them for putting me up against the Doom postmortem. I'm sure that our audiences don't overlap at all. Uh, so please uh, turn off your pagers. Um, and uh, uh, this is a, an advanced uh, design ta uh, talk, so I'm going to talk very fast. We're going to cover a lot of stuff. If you don't get it all, don't worry about it. Um, we're going to put the slides up, and, uh, and I'll stick around for questions for a long time afterward. And I'm just going to wait until somebody laughs at the joke that's on the screen. And then, thank you, Marty, and then I'm going to go on. Um, so uh, who am I? I? I have 13 years of industry experience, mostly as a game designer on all of the Halo games, especially the first three, with just a little bit on um, ODST and Reach. I did the balancing of the campaign difficulty and also the multiplayer side, as well as the tuning of all the weapons, characters, vehicles, and um, other gameplay elements. Uh, my opinions do not represent those of Bungie Management, which is probably why I don't work there anymore. So last year, uh, I gave a talk that was inspired by this painting. It's the uh, Sunday afternoon on Le Grand Jatte. And what's really interesting about this painting is the closer that you get to it, the, the more detail comes out. And so that inspired me to do a talk where I took a really trivial detail from Halo, examined it exhaustively, um, and tried to explain the design process behind it and draw universal conclusions from that. Um, it was a pretty popular talk, so the GDC guy said, come back next year, you can do any talk you want. So this is going to be my talk about what non-designers need to know. No, I'm just kidding. GDC wanted a sequel. So I was looking around for inspiration, and uh, there's a great set, uh, a series, actually, of paintings by Monet where... Um, he paints haystacks, which is not maybe the most inspiring object, but what he does is he paints them uh, from several different angles in different, during different seasons, different times of day, with, under different lighting. And so his theme was to revisit the same uh, subject matter multiple times. And so my idea was I'll revisit the same design decision over several different games. Um, last year, I spent a little bit too much time on the abstract. I didn't get to the meat enough, so um, I'm going to start right in with the detail, and anytime I get abstract, I'm going to have blue slides so you can tune out if, if that's interesting to you. So uh, the muzzle velocity is the speed that the projectile comes out of the gun of the plasma rifle, which is sort of the alien SMG. It comes out in bolts. That's the name of the projectile. On legendary difficulty, which is the hardest difficulty in the game across the Halo franchise, and um, if you don't know what Halo is, I, I don't know why you're here. Um, so isn't this the same talk as last year? Um, how much more can you say about a weapon projectile? Well, uh, the sniper rifle was primarily a, a multiplayer talk, whereas this is going to focus largely on single player. The sniper rifle is shot by the player, whereas the plasma rifle is predominantly shot at the player. Uh, I talked a lot about active flow, sort of cadence and rhythm and um, firing a, a weapon. This is going to be much more about reactive flow, the environment's effect on the player. The sniper rifle was primarily balanced for a competitive environment, whereas the plasma rifle is tuned for a, a difficulty level, which brings me to the most, I think, important point. Um, last, the last year's talk was, was about balancing, and this year's talk is about tuning. So what's the difference? Well, balance is really fundamentally about longevity. It's about being able to play the game indefinitely without... Uh, the developer having to, to change things or fix things. And so what you do is you, you um, design an element in passes, you try to keep the game in a, in a state that is continually playable, and then you release to the community and they remove all the stuff they don't like, and what, the, what you have left is something that at least some small set, uh, if you're lucky, is going to continue playing indefinitely. And it has nothing to do with fun. In fact, most of the time once the community gets done with the game, it isn't fun anymore. On the other hand, tuning is all about fun. Um, it happens all at once, and usually if it happens for one player, it's going to happen for most of your audience. Uh, and it needs to happen before release, or it's just never going to happen. It's very uh, wispy. It's, it's, hard, it's hard to nail down just what exactly is fun, and that's one of the things I'm going to try to tackle with the blue chunks. And it has nothing to do with balance. A lot of times, um, precisely because something is unbalanced is the reason why it's fun. So you know how, um, looking back on Star Wars, you thought it was about Luke, and really it's all about Darth Vader? Looking back on Halo, we could have named it Plasma Rifle, because really that's what it's all about. 
So before I start uh, getting into Halo 1, uh, um, I, I want you to imagine that you're standing on a stage, much like I'm standing on a stage, and you're in a room full of people, and they're laughing at you. Now, if you're doing stand-up comedy, that's great. If you're doing nude modeling, not so good. If you're doing a GDC talk, it's, you know, as long as it's only some laughter. Um, so really, context uh, is, is uh, what I'm trying to get at here. Um, it colors every experience that you're going to have. And it's very individual. Um, it has to do with your personal history and what skills and experience you have. And it really determines what you're expecting, what your standards are. You'll find that for a single game, they, they often share a context. They have a shared background and, and uh, expectations. And it's completely outside of your control. Perhaps you can choose your context by choosing your audience, but uh, most likely you're going to inherit an audience that you're going to have to please. So when we started Halo 1, we looked at our competition, which was Warcraft 2, until we stopped being an RTS. And then it was <laughs> Quake 2. Uh, which has um, some really unique uh, sort of um, visible projectile weapons and uh, some really common uh, guards and just a ludicrously fast space marine. Um, we played a lot of tribes, which has uh, similar kind of weapons and also this jetpacking, ludicrously fast space soldier. Um, Unreal, uh, uh, even more unique weapons, um, and a really fast space soldier. And then we looked at even our own game where we had the, the four which shot this um, slow projectile and uh, he was a really fast security officer. So another aspect of context that you need to look at is the community that's formed by your audience. Um, for us, it was going to be Myth fans, but we weren't really sure they were going to be action gamers. That, are they going to be into Halo? There are Mac gamers who, at the time, were feeling a little betrayed because we were going to be on Microsoft's console. And there were Marathon fans, but Marathon fans totally embraced the mouse, and were they going to be able to switch over to be with a controller? And on the other hand, we had this new Xbox community, which we didn't really know a ton about. We thought it was going to be younger, so maybe less sophisticated. Um, and they were going to have to deal with controllers, so how is that going to hurt their input. So we decided we're going to try to bring both of these audiences in. But it turns out the most important context for the plasma rifle is the in-game context. So uh, in the story, the plasma rifle is used by the Covenant elites, which is sort of the backbone of the alien menace. Um, it's their assault rifle. And uh, technically, we couldn't push a lot of enemies on screen. Um, so each of these guys had to be pretty powerful. So we needed a kind of a potent weapon. In multiplayer, we really wanted to use every single-player weapon in multiplayer, not just because then you'd be playing the same game in both arenas, but because we didn't really have that many weapons in Halo 1. But we didn't really have an, a clear idea of what the multiplayer role was going to be for the plasma rifle. Now, in single-player, uh, there's two things that are important. One, it's the most common scavenged weapon. So in Halo, you're always picking up weapons off the ground. And since a lot of the enemies use it, you end up using this weapon yourself quite often. And also, it's the most common enemy projectile coming at you. Which means for difficulty, since it's the most common enemy projectile, it's, it's a very large factor. As goes the plasma rifle, there goes the rest of the game. And actually, when it comes to the franchise, it's the most common enemy projectile. And it's sort of astounding how... Uh, an entire series can be defined by uh, one element, but if it's going to be one element, it's going to be the thing that you're constantly getting shot at. So, of course, you know, uh, if you know anything about me, you know I'm really into paper designs, and so um, I'm not going to show you the paper design for the Halo 1 plasma rifle because it was terrible. But here are some choice quotes. It misfires in the rain and does AOE damage underwater. <laughs> We didn't have rain, and we didn't have water, and that was the first line. Like, that was the most important thing. Um, the primary trigger is an instantaneous visible beam, which is not how it ended up at all, because it's not fun to get shot at something that, that travels instantaneously. Um, you're supposed to hold the tr second trigger to charge uh, uh, the over overcharge, except for Halo doesn't have a second trigger, so I don't know where that came from. It's more effective than other weapons against energy shields. So at least, you know, we got some of that in there. And it also disables mirror fields faster than any other weapon except for the disruptor. And there's no mirror fields in Halo, and I don't know what a disruptor is. So clearly, we had a very vague understanding of what this weapon was supposed to be. Okay, blue slides. Here we go. What is a fun activity that you're going to be able to engage with this weapon in? So first of all, uh, and these are going to be the three R's of fun, uh, it needs to be reactive. It needs to be a repeatable activity, and it needs to be reliable. So what, I mean, what do I mean by any of that? Um, 
nobody can have fun for you. So uh, fun requires that the player participate. And if you're going to participate in something, it needs to be interactive. So that means um, that in order to be fun, something has to be reactive. It needs to be repeatable. I'm um, sort of known for saying that uh, Halo has 30 seconds of fun, which we repeat over and over. But I could have said that um, Halo is fun for 30 seconds, and then something better change, because you have to play that 30 seconds exactly over again. It's not going to be very much fun. And so what this activity needs to do is re resist habituation. What is habituation, you may ask? So I just got back from the Caribbean, um, and being from Seattle, uh, when we first got there, the sun felt very, very hot. And after a little while, um, it stopped feeling so hot. I didn't notice it anymore until I got a horrible sunburn. And what was happening there was um, I, my nerves and my skin were getting habituated to the sensation of the sun. And habituation is the reduction in sensitivity when something happens over and over and over again. Now, you might think this is um, bad, as in the case of a sunburn, but it's actually extremely important, as I found out later, when my sunburn started to heal, and it itched madly, and I couldn't sleep, and I couldn't have a conversation, and I couldn't even really think straight because I couldn't do anything but feel my skin. And if you didn't have habituation, you would feel like that all the time. Habituation is also a really crucial learning tool, so when you see something in a game over and over and over, you get habituated to it, um, you stop noticing it, and you start noticing the differences between the experiences that allow you to analyze them and come up with different strategies. But it's also the designer's mortal enemy. Habituation makes you bored. So what you should be going for in a fun experience is um, predictable enough that you can habituate to it somewhat and learn it, but not so predictable, not so habituatable um, that uh, you get bored. And finally, it needs to be reliable. Um, it needs to be fun every time for as many people as possible, ideally. And it turns out these uh, kind of reliable activities are extraordinarily rare, and you probably participated in most of them by the time you were five or six. What do I mean by that? You didn't throw a grenade before you were six, hopefully, unless you're um, breaking the ESRB. So grenades are a staple of Halo gameplay. But really, when you look at the experience of throwing a grenade, it's really close to Peggle, which finds its roots in games like Arkanoid. I mean, how many of you are itching for that ball to go right up that crack and then bounce up and around there? Uh, if you don't know what Arkanoid is, um, maybe Angry Birds is a better reference uh, for throwing grenades, which goes back to like in physical activities like pool. You know, um, what angle do I have to hit the bumper at in order for to, to make the pocket? Um, which even you know, even when you were a little child, throwing stuff in a waste paper basket. It's all that same kind of fundamental activity that you could just do forever. So maybe you're not convinced. What about melee? Uh, it's another Halo staple really important part of the game, it never gets old, just like it never got old in Final Fight, um, just like it convinced you to hit all those stupid flash banner ads. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't find the punch a monkey. There is no like actual copy of that on the internet anymore, but um, which, when you think about it, is really just a callback to, to Whack-A-Mole, and Whack-A-Mole is just a machine playing sort of a violent version of Peekaboo. And this is my son. <laughs> And he's super cute, so I wanted to use him in my presentation. How about the Warthog? Uh, the Warthog, way slider than any actual vehicle, just like in Mario Kart, which is very similar to skiing, which is just like sliding around in your socks, or in her socks, preferably. So why are these things fun? Um, there's a book called The Brain That Changes Itself, and uh, it talks about people who have suffered um, mostly brain injuries or birth defects that uh, use um, practice and, and rote uh, skills to um, sort of regenerate their, uh, their, their, their brain tissue. And it says that a trained or stimulated neuron develops 25% uh, more branches, increases its uh, size, and, and it gets a lot of more blood supply going through it. And so um, my theory is that just like physical exercise is fun just for the sake of exercise, mental exercise is fun in the same way. So if you look at dodging, um, which is something that you did when you were a child, um, there's lots and lots of things that you're doing. You are... Um, you're detecting movement in your peripheral vision, and you're tracking objects as they move across the space, um, which translates really well into 2D in a game like uh, Commando, for instance. Um, but it, 
it's even better in 3D where you're trying to take the nonlinear change in size of a projectile as it comes toward you and determine when it's going to intersect with you and uh, predict its trajectory or determine the closest point that it's going to reach so you know exactly how far you have to dodge. So uh, just a quick tangent, the conventional wisdom is that 3D sucks. And um, maybe the technology isn't there yet, but eventually games are going to be in 3D and they're going to be way more fun because they're going to tap more directly into those brain circuits. Okay. Uh, games uh, other than Halo are fun for this reason. So um, your brain is really good at pattern matching and actually has like physical hardware for that. So that explains things like Tetris. Um, Predicting complex systems with a, an almost intuition level is common. Um, you have special circuits for determining a rate of change and especially comparing one rate of change to another. So if you've ever tried to see if your healer's mana was going to last longer than a boss's life in WoW, that's what you're doing. Um, path planning is pretty obvious in a game like Pac-Man, but it's also when you're trying to complete three or four quests in an area, you're trying to do it most efficiently. Your plasticity is um, sort of how you make new connections that you never had before. I think Portal probably stretched everybody's brains a little bit. And finally, um, another thing that you're hardwired for is uh, to have a theory of mind to um, try to get inside somebody else's head, which is very useful in something like Street Fighter or even a slow game like chess. So back to reality. Okay. So we need something that's reactive, repeatable, reliable that exercises your dodging circuits. And so we rewrote the plasma uh, rifle paper design to say it's a high rate of fire uh, gun that shoots plasma bolts that travel at a fast but dodgeable speed. Um, so that mechanic works itself out in, in this way. Um, we don't want it to be too fast. We want to give you enough time to dodge. And, if, and also we want it to be slow enough that it's a continuous motion um, because we're actually just throwing you 30 throwing up 30 still frames a second. Um, if you can't connect those uh, in your brain into a single believable real object, then you can't um, engage those dodging circuits. And we gave it a really visible contrail, um, which was especially useful in the, in the PAL version, actually, which are, where it's harder to dodge because you're getting fewer updates. But we didn't want it to be too slow. I mean, it's sort of comical if the bullets are just hanging in air. And we still want you to experience all those near misses. So that just brings me to a sort of a fundamental definition of game mechanics where you divide the potential gameplay into two parts, actions that are permitted and actions that aren't permitted. So um, Mario cannot jump over the flag. Mario cannot run left. There are just things that Mario cannot do. This is good because it allows us to constrain the game. Um, but the problem is that one mechanic isn't, isn't a game. It's not even really interactive. Uh, if you only have one constraint, then you're not making any choices I, I recently made my first Flash game, and it's Pac-Man in a line. Um, basically, there's no ghosts, there's no maze, you just eat all the dots, and it's boring. So if we look at a Halo mechanic, um, let's say that there's a mechanic where your handheld weapon it beats distant enemies, right? And so if they are distant, then you win. If, if, if they're not distant, then you lose. Sort of a contemporary design theory is that, excuse me, that you should layer um, new mechanics on top of this one. And if you layer off enough, enough mechanics, then you're going to make a game. And if your game isn't fun, they should layer on more mechanics. But I really I think all that does is give you a, a larger number of choices that you aren't making. So what I suggest is uh, that you want to... Um, have mechanics that support each other, sort of like a, a tripod that they're, they're leaning against each other. And the, all the area inside is the gameplay. And so a game, a sandbox game has, you know, a huge area and, a, and a, maybe a more linear game has a much smaller area, but it, at least there's lots of different um, possible places that the player could be at any given time. So that means that the projectile mechanics also need to be supported by AI mechanics. So they lead your peers and we had them fight from the open so that you could see them fighting from the open and dodging and that would teach you to dodge. We also made them shoot directly at the player because it's a lot easier to dodge something that's coming straight at you rather than trying to figure out which direction you, you're going to need to dodge. We gave them a little bit of small error, so it wasn't quite as uh, predictable. And they also shoot in bursts, so sort of like a fad, uh, fan pattern. Doom, 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 doom. Uh, they kind of swing it across. Um, but they don't track the player during a burst, so if you start dodging a burst, you're going to be able to dodge the rest of it. 
The player mechanics also needed to support this, so um, instead of having the blazingly fast super soldier, um, we had a agonizingly slow super soldier, um, mostly relying on the acceleration of going left to right. In order, you have to anticipate what you're going to dodge. You can't just immediately move out, out of the way uh, as if you um, were a Ferrari. And we also had a narrow field, uh, field of view, which is um, which was not not a common thing at the time. Uh, PC games had you know the crazy fisheye views, um, and the reason is um, it makes objects that are distant in the middle of the screen feel like they're much closer and larger, and uh, that allows you to track projectiles a lot better. Because instead of get, being really 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 small and then all of a sudden being huge and in your face, they're actually increasing uh, as they would in the real world by uh, inverse square law. We gave the player shields, which uh, recharge after a short time. Um, so that means if you're dodging and you get a couple shots, it's not that risky. And so we actually increase the amount of damage that a plasma rifle will do against shields. But at the same time, we gave you body health that doesn't recharge. So um, we wanted to um, preserve your life by, by making you do a little bit less damage uh, uh, to body. When it comes to difficulty, in Halo 1 is pretty straightforward. We had these red elites, and they were like tougher versions of the blue elites. They shot more bursts. They shot longer bursts, so they're a little bit harder. And we had a, a global weapon damage scale, so on Legendary, everything did about twice as much damage to the player. So mechanics, mechanics are universal. If, if the game designer writes down plasma rifle bolts are dodgeable, then they are in abstract mechanic land. But they need to be calibrated to make them personal, personal and effective in the real world. These are the actual numbers that create the experience that the mechanic is describing and make uh, the plasma rifle da dodgeable for a certain player. So in Halo, it was calibrated for me. Actually, I've said that before. Actually, it's not precisely true. So ask yourself, and hopefully you're not already asking this of yourself, why did you come to this talk today? Confabulation! The truth is that uh, you can't re recreate your subconscious mind in your conscious mind. It's like trying to emulate an Xbox on an Atari 2600. It just doesn't fit. And so what you have is an internal model, which um, you use to guess at your own motivations. Usually it's pretty accurate because you have a lot of experience with yourself. But what you should do is also build one of these internal models for the player. That way you can predict the player reactions. And so when you're calibrating, you're calibrating for this little internal guy that you believe is what uh, is representative of every player. So uh, this is my job. It's also the series of steps that led to the calibration of the, of the plasma rifle. Um, the process uh, uh, for me usually goes like this. I make my best guess, which in this case was 10, because I had no idea. 10 is uh, world units per second, which is a, a unit of measurement that means absolutely nothing to you. Um, and then I would try the extremes. So I would try 20, and I'm like, wow, that is almost instantaneous, or one, and then I have to wait for the bullets to get to me, and sometimes I forget they're there and fall asleep, and then they hit me. Um, so then I narrow in on the value. So I tried five, and that was better, but it was still way too easy to dodge. So I moved to 15, which, oh, that is too fast. And then I moved to 13, which is totally dodgeable until I try to pay attention to something else and shoot back and then I'm getting hit again. So I turned it to 11, which felt really good. And then after a while, it kind of felt too good. So then I bumped it up to 12. 12. So the uh, experience um, that your calibration gives you uh, is something that you need to test or use your research, obviously. Um, for us, we found that players could dodge the plasma bolts and that felt really good for them. Um, but it had some unintended consequences in Halo 1. Um, First, they were fighting out in the open, so they saw more of the enemy behaviors, which is good, uh, but they also died without seeking cover um, because they wanted to only fight out from the open, which was not so good. And then uh, it was also extremely broken. So basically, you can always dodge the plasma rifle in, in Halo, um, and this is why. Uh, if you aim directly at the player uh, as an AI and the player's moving, you're going to miss. So... You could solve that by trying to lead. The problem is, if they zigzag at all, you miss by even more. If your projectile is dramatically slower than the player, then this is not a solvable problem. And basically, if you know that this is the case in Halo, you can break the game um, pretty badly on pretty much every difficulty level and in every encounter. So that's bad. So when it comes to multiplayer, um, we had added movement stuns, so when you get shot by the plasma rifle, um, 
It makes it you can't turn as fast and you can't move as fast. And that was to compensate for the fact that it just wasn't, you know, it, you, you couldn't use it at, at, at a good range because it was traveling so slowly. But the unintended consequence of that was that movement sound was really annoying. It works okay in Counter-Strike when you're going to get shot three times and then die. But in our game, when you could take a lot of hits, you would just have to sit there and take a lot of hits, um, which conflicted with the Halo flavor quite a bit. It was also horribly broken because you could use it on vehicles, uh, which, whatever. It was a short development cycle, what can I say? Now, when it comes to legendary, um, this is kind of interesting because uh, the plasma rifle, as all weapons, did twice as much damage. So that made legendary very difficult. Um, had some unintended consequences. Basically, uh, the the um, difficulty scale was stacking with the material scale I described earlier. So against shields, it was actually doing almost four times as much damage, which meant that it was taking down your shields almost instantly. Um, the way this was badly broken <laughs> was, uh, so uh, dodging was not actually any harder. So in on normal, you could um, dodge back and forth, and every, every projectile would miss you, and if a couple hit you, that was fine, you just take cover. In legendary, you could dodge back and forth in the exact same way, the same number of bolts would hit you, and they would kill you. So you, we weren't actually making the game harder, we were just making it more um, punishing. But luckily, we got a chance to fix everything in Halo 2. So again, we're looking at the competition. Um, Ghost Recon came about that time, uh, and it was different than like an Unreal and that had instant projectiles. It was really encouraging you to fight from cover. Uh, Rainbow Six came out, and uh, it also had instant projectiles and fighting from cover. And Counter-Strike, and SWAT, and Medal of Honor, and Minivel, and Call of Duty, and Killswitch. So basically, we're seeing a trend here. Um, people want instant projectiles and fighting from cover. And we looked at our own community, and the Halo uh, 1 pistol is... Um, really unbalanced and really popular. And uh, we think that's probably because, hey, it's an instant projectile. Legendary is also, you know, like I described before, completely unbalanced and very popular, which means that people enjoy the fighting from cover, even if it's excessively punishing. So we talked earlier about how fun requires participation, and what that means is that fun uh, requires buy-in. Um, basically, people will play the game that they want to play uh, no matter what. I did the Halo 1 tutorial, and before giving you a weapon in the original version of the tutorial, I would throw you into combat, and the idea was, we'll teach people to run away. What we tell people was, run up next to a guy and let them shoot you to death, because you can't figure out how to kill them, because you can't, because you don't have a weapon yet. People, they, they, they go with their expectation um, over any kind of hint text or um, uh, recommendation that you can make. Again, the most important context tended to be in the game. Um, the elites in Halo 2 uh, were not the faceless enemy that they were in Halo 1. In fact, sometimes they were your allies, and at some points in the game you were actually playing as an elite. And so they needed an instant projectile weapon uh, in their arsenal. Also, um, in, in single player, we decided since dodging is not fixable, maybe we'll emphasize fighting for cover a little bit more. And in multiplayer, since movement sound is just not fitting with the game, again, we, we want to have some sort of instant projectile on the plasma rifle, or at least much faster projectile, which brings me to interlude number two. So uh, every Christmas, I ask my grandma for a subscription to Edge magazine. And every Christmas, I get a subscription to Game Pro magazine. <laughs> Thank you, grandma. <laughs> but... Lately, it's paid off because GamePro is actually turning into a very good magazine. And recently they had uh, an article uh, uh, called The Psychology of Shooters. Um, and in it, they uh, describe a study uh, done by uh, a pair of researchers named Andrew Presbilski and Scott Rigby um, where they modded Half-Life and they had one version where it was bloody and horrible and guts and violence and one version where it was nonviolent. It was sort of like a game of tag. And what they found was that both versions equally satisfied the basic needs that they were looking for, um, which were competence and autonomy. Um, and you can read this either in GamePro or on Jamie Madigan's blog, psychologyofgames.com, which I heartily recommend. So their, their eventual um, uh, sort of conclusion was that shooters satisfy human needs, and um, because 
both bloody shooter and tag shooter uh, both satisfy competence and autonomy, they're both equally fun. But we all know that tag of duty would not sell. And I believe the reason is that our needs are much more complex than simple uh, competence or autonomy. And I figure out everything with graphs, so let's make one. Um, why uh, is it is uh, let's see. So dodging is a competence, right? Uh, it's something you get good at. But why is it way more fun to dodge on normal than it is on legendary? when it kind of cheapens legendary if you can just dodge everything. And covering is always a choice, but why is it a more interesting choice on legendary when you really don't have any choice, you have to go take cover? And why is it more fun to dodge grunts and more fun to cover from elites? And why is it more fun to dodge if you're playing aggressively and it's more fun to cover if you f feel like you're wanting to play defensively? Um, and my answer is that uh, a competence in a, in a shooter um, specifically dodging, is much more fun when you're under low pressure. And autonomy is much more fun when you're trying to tackle a, a, a problem that's much more difficult. So when games satisfy these complex needs, that's when they are really fun. Um, and this complexity comes from the context that the needs are being satisfied in. Now, um, we already found out we can't control the context because that's part of the audience. Um, so what we have to do is match our fun activity to the content, context that those players are already uh, experiencing. So for instance, um, context can make an activity feel natural when the activity flows out of the context. Um, some great examples of this, Assassin's Creed. Um, there's no question in anybody's mind that this is uh, intending for them to sneak, and it feel the world really, really uh, ingrains in you that you should be sneaking. I think the best example of the last year or so is Super Meat Boy. That poor guy is designed to die over and over and over and over again. But a context will also make an activity meaningful. Um, I think this is what Clint Hawking was talking about in his talk yesterday. Um, I'm still processing it, so I'm not exactly sure. Um, rescuing the princess for uh, making it through a mission or um, becoming the Pokemon master. Um, so what we did uh, back in reality where we split the plasma pistol and the plasma rifle bolts. So the plasma pistol became the slow dodgeable version and the plasma rifle became the faster one that forced you to cover. And then on different difficulty levels, we sped up the projectile. So on normal, the plasma rifle is still dodgeable if you're far enough away, but on legendary, it's never dodgeable. And we changed the AI mechanics, again, split them. So the grunt kind of fights like your kid brother, like they shoot straight at you and they're really easy to confuse and... If you hide, they come and look, like, directly. Whereas the elites are a lot more coming, cunning. They lead the player, um, and because they have a faster projectile, that's okay again. Um, they track during the burst so that you have to consistently dodge the entire burst. And also, um, they, uh, they uh, suppress you before they come search. So what that means is if you take cover, um, they'll shoot at the cover and shoot around where you, they think you're going to be coming up, and they'll do that for a good 15, 20 seconds before then coming up and very carefully from, from usually a, as far away as they can, peeking around the cover to see if you're still there. We had two protagonists in Halo 2. There's the chief, and we stopped displaying his health because what we wanted to do was make it so that as soon as your shields were down, you ran for cover. And you ran for cover with, the, with this feeling of, oh my goodness, this is really dangerous and scary. But then we increased how fast the shields recharged, so you didn't have to stay in cover for very long. Because uh, in Halo 1, you could just stand out of cover and dodge back and forth until your shields came back, and you were shooting the whole time. It's, it's a little bit more boring to stand behind a rock, so we wanted it to take less time. And we even moved the, um, the shield meter right next to the motion tracker, so you could be crouching behind cover, looking at your shields, and at the motion tracker to see if somebody was coming around the cover after you. For the Arbiter, we experimented with uh, like an invisibility where he could turn himself invisible for just long enough for his shields to almost start recharging um, with more or less success. So I already mentioned that shots travel faster on Legendary, um, but we also uh, changed how the weapon damage scale works. So first of all, it's per weapon now. It's no longer global in Halo 2, which meant that the plasma pistol we could make do a little bit more damage, but not really significantly, whereas the plasma rifle we could make do a lot more damage. We're totally going to drive you into cover. Turns out this is a terrible way to balance difficulty, but um, I didn't know that at the time. When we were um, calibrating, 
Oh, uh, shoot, we didn't calibrate. Sorry about that, tail two. So almost at the end of the project, our AI accounts got cut dramatically. We had to strip objects out like crazy, and um, we had very little time to recalibrate um, any of the weapons. So they ended up being about 15 world units per second. So slightly faster than Halo 1, and then a legendary much, much faster. So the normal experience of the player playing uh, with in Halo 2 was that they can dodge grunts pretty easily and at least force them to cover. So, so far, so good. Unfortunately, because we had to remove so much cover, um, there wasn't enough. And a lot of times you'd be fighting guys that were supposed to drive you into cover, and there was maybe one piece of cover if we remembered to leave it in there. And because we had introduced Havoc in Halo 2, sometimes that cover would move. So they would throw a grenade at you, and your cover would go flying off the cliff, and then you'd be completely exposed. But that's not why it was totally broken. Why it was totally broken was because of the suppressing fire I talked about earlier. The AI would overfocus to a ridiculous degree, and I'll try to explain that. So basically, um, the way to uh, always get the advantage in Halo 2 is to take cover and then pop out at a different spot. So um, if the AI is shooting at you, you don't go behind cover, and then you pop out from the other side, and then you get two or three seconds to shoot at them before they shoot back. And then they start shooting at you, and you go back behind the cover, and you pop out on the first side. And it takes two or three seconds for them to figure out this tactic, and you can just do it over and over and over and over again. And uh, if you ever played Legendary, you almost certainly figured this out, because it's the only way to get through. As far as multiplayer, um, the faster projectiles that the plasma rifle had were great, because they made the weapon useful at range, and we removed entirely the idea of movement stun from the game. Um, unfortunately, there was a bug that meant that if you were carrying an SMG, which was everywhere in Halo 2, and a plasma rifle, um, you were doing almost twice as much damage as anybody else. It was intended to reduce the amount of damage, but that wasn't fixed until the patch. And it was totally broken, because if you put two plasma rifles together, um, you could basically drop somebody's shields almost instantaneously. And also, because the projectiles were moving faster for the player, um, the plasma pistol overcharge that we had added, is, uh, that's where they got the term noob combo. So, on Legendary, the experience is actually harder. It's not just more punishing, it's actually more difficult to dodge. Unfortunately, it is still more punishing, and especially on Marines. If you're playing Legendary on Halo 2, your Marines' lifespan is about 10 seconds. And it was totally broken, because um, we had engagement distances that were very far, which worked fine in Halo 1, because um, the AI would uh, close on you until, until it's kind of slow projectiles were, were effective, but those projectiles were effective at a much farther distance. In fact, they were effective at a range beyond what even the player's weapons were effective at. And so when you get something like a Jetpack Elite wielding two plasma rifles, which we've already talked about as unbalanced in multiplayer, um, and then you add a 4X multiplayer on top of that, um, and they're jumping around, and they have recharging energy shields, you get a game that's really, really way too hard, especially my level. Um, but luckily... We got to try it again. Um, uh, our competition, as you can see, um, lots and lots of military games, and several of them feature cover systems. Now, our community at this point um, had been almost entirely single-player focused story guys, um, but with Halo 2 and Xbox Live, we started to get a much larger multiplayer community until they were given about roughly equal weight in Halo 3. Um, and Halo became known for that kind of free-flowing combat um, that uh, Halo 2 had got us, you know, dodging and sidestepping and covering. Um, and so a cover system where you're sticking in the cover just really didn't fit for us. So we decided against... Uh, we're, we're, we figured our audience was established enough that we could sort of start ignoring the competition a little bit and um, going our own way. But again, the, the uh, in-game context was the most important. Um, there's no enemy elites in Halo 3. They switch sides um, on the Covenant. And uh, so sometimes context is not outside of developer control, but it is outside of designer control. And that means there's no enemy plasma rifles because um, the Brutes use the Spiker and the Jackals use the Carbine and uh, Grunts use the Needler. And so nobody on the enemy side is using the plasma rifle. So does that mean my talk is over? No, it means an interlude. Um, so pretty clearly, Halo 2 was a misstep uh, how much of a misstep is up for interpretation, but um, 
I spent a lot of time after Halo 2 ships. Uh, I went on a soul-searching journey to try to find out, you know, what what should we have done? What would have been fun? I looked at lots of industry resources. Uh, Raf Koster says that games are edutainment. Will Wright says games are exploring a possibility space. Far be it for me to disagree with Will Wright. Uh, Sid Meier uh, says games are a series of interesting choices. Um, but when I looked at all these descriptions that designers were giving, they're describing their own games, not really every game, and certainly not Halo. So I looked into academia. Um, I hope there's not too many academics in here, or I may not make it out alive. Uh, I just picked one of their definitions at random. Games are an exercise of voluntary control systems in which there is an opposition between forces confined by a procedure and rules in order to produce a disequilibrial outcome. Yeah. These areas aren't giving us a definition that is super useful. What they're doing is dissecting games into their various components, which is um, good for categorizing, um, not so good for building something that defies categories. Uh, I'm a philosopher by background. That's what my schooling is about. So uh, I just kind of leafed through some of my old uh, philosophy texts. Aristotle talks a lot about um, catharsis and sort of how... Uh, Entertainment is about bringing your, yourself back into balance. So that's interesting. Um, Pascal says that games are a distraction from your imminent death. Uh, Wittgenstein says that uh, games cannot be defined, which is not helpful, because then he says, because you already know what they are. And he's just trying to make a point about language, and so that doesn't help me at all. Um, my, my final conclusion was that game designers should be philosophers. I think it actually helps you sit outside yourself and understand what you're thinking. Um, but philosophers are not game designers. Chixon Mihaly, uh, in his book Flow, says that um, uh, flow, or some people could translate that into fun, is the immersion of the self in an activity. And he talks about the autotelic experience. And that basically means... Um, what you're doing is completely pouring into yourself, and it has no purpose apart from itself, from yourself, even if it's accomplishing some other goal. Um, uh, two other psychologists, um, Dusty and Ryan, talk a lot about um, self-determination theory, which is that uh, human needs motivate people, which includes players. Um, they focus a lot on intrinsic needs and extrinsic needs. Um, I, I think their research is great, and I think Flo has a really great, a lot of great insights but I sort of have a different take on the categories, which I will attempt to explain with a graph. Um, so uh, if you try to find a couple of um, uh, orthogonal ways to classify needs, um, you'll, you'll find that uh, some needs are need needs, meaning if you don't have them, you feel rotten. And some needs are want needs, where if you get them, it's a positive emotion, but if you don't have them, you're not sitting around miserable. And I decided to call those requirements for the need needs and aspirations for, for those that are more positive but also optional. Now, clearly, games are not, you're not going to die if you're not playing a game, so uh, games probably provide aspirational needs of some kind. I also sort of played off of um, flow and the, the idea of autotelic um, activities to come up with two new concepts um, of endotelic and exotelic. So uh, telic is from teleos, which means sort of like the goal or the end. Um, endo and exo meaning inner and outer. Uh, so basically you have things that you do because you want um, a goal that comes from outside. So that's like cake right? I want cake, and it's going to end up inside of me, and I don't really care how it's provided. I don't really care if I made the cake as long as it tastes good. Whereas exotelic is actually I'm being used for something. So um, a lot of uh, causes and religions are based on this, um, but much more humbly for games, it's just uh, my skills are being used to make something happen, which is why games need to be interactive. Um, so that you can participate in them and cause something to happen. So I would put games into this upper right quadrant. And fun is the positive emotion that you get from, from meeting those needs. So if you think back to the graph, 
fun is that quadrant of uh, uh, meeting an exotelic aspiration. A game is a series of constraints on an activity that reliably and repeatably uh, meet that exotelic aspiration for a specific audience. And I'm pretty just, I'm pretty sure that I just said that games are about fulfilling your dreams. So I'm going to go back to the red slide, sorry. Um, so what exactly is the exotelic aspiration that a plasma rifle is intended to fulfill? Well, uh, uh, I, I think you have to describe these needs sort of um, uh, uh, poetically. Uh, they're not necessarily something reduced to a technical term. So the first one is I think they make the player feel like they're on another level. They're um, making their enemies look dumb. And running rings around them is a good, a good uh, sort of trope. Um, you want to manipulate your enemies and frighten them and play with them before you kill them. I think the plasma rifle also fulfills uh, the, the aspiration to be cool under fire. You're facing danger, and it's real danger, but you approach it with like kind of a discipline, and um, you, you don't panic, and you do things just the right way, and you end up winning. And also, uh, the plasma rifle is all about turning the tables. So the enemy is trying to use the plasma rifle on you, and you take it from them, and you use it on them and their friends much more effectively than they could. Turns out, this is not just about the plasma rifle. This is about every enemy weapon. So even though Halo 3 doesn't really feature the plasma rifle, the legacy of the plasma rifle goes through to all the other enemy weapons in the game. So for almost every weapon that the enemy uses in uh, Halo 3, uh, it's slower for enemies. Um, basically, they start out a little bit slow, and then they accelerate, which gives you plenty of time to see where it's coming and to dodge it. Um, they also have ramp-up times, so the the rate of fire actually increases the longer you hold on the trigger. Um, but it's much faster for players. So the player in Halo 3 always uses the speed that the AI would have on Legendary, and that includes multiplayer. Um, when you're firing a weapon, you don't, as a player, care very much that it starts out slow as long as it gets to a quick speed very fast so you have the, the range that you need. And players don't burst fire, at least not in the short bursts that the AI does, so the ramp up isn't as much of a factor for them. This means that the player can always turn the tables on the enemy by picking up their weapon and using it against them. The AI, for grunts, is like comically incompetent. They're always running away and panicking and putting their arms up in the air. And um, We made sure that you could kill them with a single melee attack so you can kind of jump down amongst them like a cat among the mice and just start swinging. But the elites, on the other hand, are um, they're dangerous, but they're, it's a manageable danger. Um, we added uh, an idea in the AI of like out of cover firing. So um, when you first emerge from cover, uh, they're going to take a little while to start shooting at you. They're going to shoot at you um, in shorter bursts with longer durations between them. But the longer you stay out of cover, they're going to start honing in on you. They're going to be more accurate. They're going to shoot more often. They're going to shoot with less time in between shots. And so um, what this meant was that uh, for a while, you could stay out of cover but after a while, without you even noticing it, because you probably were habituated, um, the AI would just suddenly be able to start hitting you, and that would drive you back into cover. We reduced the damage scale on Legendary, that global damage scale that was so high before, um, because we just decided that damage is not the right way to make a game harder. I believe that the right way to make a game harder is to make it faster. So um, the same experience uh, slowed down becomes easy. The same experience sped up becomes harder. Projectiles go faster, the AI fire delays get shorter. In fact, the entire combat cycle gets faster, so it's probably like 22 seconds of fun or something like that. And this uh, em uh, emerged in a concept uh, we call reciprocal difficulty. So basically, it's a form of dynamic difficulty, but it's not handled by the, um, by the computer or the AI. It's actually driven by the player. So the more you push a Halo encounter, the more it pushes back which rewards risk, because if you push really hard, you can break through very fast, as long as you can handle how hard it's pushing back at you. But at the same time, it forgives failure. So as soon as you withdraw, it withdraws. You'll notice in Halo, the AI don't really chase you very much, um, and we don't punish you at all for risking and then failing and running away. Your shields come back, your health comes back. The AI resets, basically. So I recently read a really fascinating book called Slights of Mind, and it's uh, a couple of neuroscientists who go into the world of magic, and they try to learn everything they can from the techniques that the magicians have um, 
to figure out what's going on inside of the brain of the people that they're fooling. And one of the things that they talk about um, in the context of a um, pickpocket is that you have a spotlight of attention. And anytime you attend to one thing, you are ignoring virtually everything else that is not happening in your spotlight. So that's the tunnel vision that uh, we describe. And magicians exploit this feature mercilessly. They, the doves fly up, and you all look up, as most of you probably looked up just because they went like that. And then over here, they're doing something else. And I figure, you know, if magicians can do that, if they can use distraction, then a game designer should be able to do the opposite uh, in order to kind of hyper-focus while they're calibrating. So just a random smattering of ideas on how to focus your attention. Um, I always create custom test spaces so that nothing else is going on except for the thing that I'm trying to calibrate. Um, you obviously can't ship a game that way because eventually you need to try it all together, but I found that um, it, it helps you focus and not get distracted on the other things that are broken or if they're too fun, get distracted just playing the game. Um, I use post-it notes, so if I'm balancing the plasma rifle, I'll put a post-it note that says plasma rifle on the screen. Right now I have one that says talk faster. Um, I stare at Rorschach tests uh, and try not to see pictures. I, I don't know. This is like the equivalent of last year's mouth noises with the warthog, but... Um, I, I feel like if you can uh, prov like train your brain to go into a state where it's not looking for patterns, you'll be able to see um, specific patterns and put your spotlight directly on them um, more effectively. You need to avoid habituation. Um, the way I do that is uh, take periodic breaks. Again, the custom test spaces are great for that because you play through it, and then when you get to the end, you just take a break. Or maybe you, you try tweaking something else. Um, Sometimes I'll intentionally break something. I usually don't check this in, but I'll just I'll just break something and play the game with a broken plasma rifle for a while. So I habituate to something else, and then when I put it back, uh, I'm more um, sensitive to it. And I also do total recalibrations, and this drives producers nuts. But I'll basically save off a copy, blank out everything, and try to retune it from scratch. And then I'll compare the two, and I'll say, oh, these are really close. I bet you that's, you know, right. Or, hey, these are totally different. And then I kind of have things, two things to compare, and people can tell me which one they like more. So at the end of all that, uh, in Halo 3, 14 world units per second, about 75% faster on Legendary and in multiplayer. The normal experience was that um, even on Legendary, you can dodge for short amounts of time, um, but eventually you have to return it into cover. Uh, the unintended consequences were of this was that... Um, we started to see players uh, sort of standardizing how they were playing. So even on normal or on legendary, different quality of players, they would kind of have the same pattern. And it was, at, and we would see that uh, a level was taking about the same time for everybody to complete. And it wasn't badly broken, which was a good thing. Uh, in multiplayer, um, people started to use the plasma rifle more often because it was faster and it was more effective. And uh, especially when combining arms with teammates, um, we uh, saw people want to use the alien weapons more, and they wanted to play as elites more, which was uh, useful later on. And again, not badly broken. The legendary experience, legendary is very hard. It's supposed to be. But it's not punishing hard. It just requires a very high level of skill. And so we saw people especially reviewers that were playing on higher difficulty levels were giving it a higher score. And we also developed this bizarre sub-community where they play solo, legendary, all skulls on, if you know what the skulls are. I mean, that makes it incredibly hard, but at the same time, it's still doable because we're not cranking up the damage to ridiculous levels. So, hopefully, not badly broken. Which brings me to ODST, which was named Halo 3 ODST for a reason, because the sandbox didn't really change. Which brings me to Halo Reach. <laughs> Uh, where the plasma rifle was reborn as the plasma rifle. So our competition was <laughs> pretty clear. Um, we, by that time, had a large collection of sub-communities. So there's the multiplayer-only community. There's the people that just wanted to jump into Forge. Um, Firefight was really popular. And uh, one of the sub-communities was Halo developers. Um, basically... Almost every member of the original team had already moved on to the next big thing by then, and um, fully half of the Reach team was hired after uh, Halo 3 shipped. So that meant, to some extent, Halo Reach was made by the community, for the community, and they were very in tune with what the community wanted, um, which 
brought up things like elites versus Spartans, where they wanted total weapon parity between uh, the elite weapons and the Spartan weapons, which meant that they needed a elite assault rifle, which is what the plasma repeater eventually became. Um, and that meant well, basically all, all they wanted for, for that game was the instant projectiles, because it, otherwise it just wasn't fair. It's hard to hit some, uh, a human with a, with a dodgeable projectile. And they really were intent on going back to the feel of Halo 1, back to fighting elites. They removed dual wielding. Um, there are lots more plasma rifles in the game. So according to the Halo Reach strategy guide, uh, did I mention I didn't really work on this game? The plasma rifle's primary purpose is to disable the shields of close, you know, I forget it. Um, I'm gonna take a lesson from the plasma rifle. I'm gonna kinda dodge this one. It's not fair for an ex bungee designer to talk about the decisions that the current design team made, and uh, I'm almost out of time anyway. But you find that in uh, the middle of the project, things were very different than Halo 3, but by the end of the project, they had sort of veered back in the direction of what uh, we had at the end of Halo 3. So, conclusions. Tuning and balancing are not the same. Balance is about longevity, uh, especially in multiplayer, and tuning is really the, the craft of um, making something fun, which is, depending on which... Uh, theory section you agreed with, specialized brain circuit activity, or performing a skill in a natural meaning in full context, or meeting exotelic aspiration. The tuning process, uh, first you understand your audience, either by choosing it or inheriting it, um, because your audience is inseparable from their context. Then you find their exotelic aspiration, or the activity that they want to do. Um, you choose a fun activity that is reactive, repeatable, reliable, and keep in mind these are rare, and that's why you're going to very rarely uh, invent an entirely new kind of game. Then you in integrate the mechanics so that they support each other and calibrate the values to your internal player model, sometimes starting over from scratch, and then verify the experience through user research, and hopefully nothing is badly broken. And now I am out of here. I don't really have time for questions. Uh, we have like 30 seconds left, uh, which is not enough time uh, for the first questioner to usually get out their question. So if you have them, you can email me at Jamie Reesmer. I have a lot more time on my hands now. And uh, I'm also uh, writing in more detail on a lot of this stuff on my website, the, the tip of the spear com. And I have plenty of business cards up here. If anybody has uh, any questions they want to email me or if they want a personal version of this talk or would like to offer me a job. Thank you.